Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Pits of Motor Chaos. It's your old Dave. I got a lot of special guests. Top alcohol director, driver Johnny Otten. How's it going, Johnny? Hey, glad to be here. How's everybody doing? Hopefully everybody's doing good with all this uh, coronavirus going on in the world. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty insane, uh, the worldwide madness we got. Yeah, kind of putting a halt on the drag racing for a little bit here. Yeah, definitely, uh, definitely Jones and to go racing right now. It's tough. But, uh, you know, we got to do what we got to do. Yep. So now, let, let me go back in time with you, Johnny. How, how did you get into drag racing? You know, I grew up around drag racing. Um, my dad drag raced. His uncle and all his buddies kind of grew up doing it, too, from teenagers. And uh, so I really didn't know any different. So like a lot of people, you know, you grow up around what your parents are doing. And and uh, drag racing was definitely it. So, you know, I just thought it was kind of a lifestyle and, and just always loved it. And, uh, you know, really grew up at Southern California racetracks, Orange County and um, Bakersfield, you know, Pomona so many tracks around here you know, on the west coast back then and um so i just didn't really know any different i just kind of always loved to do it and i just couldn't wait to drive as a kid and it took me a while to wedge my dad out of the driver's seat and finally get in it now what 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 did your dad used to drag race you know what he um he drag raced a lot of different things um it was a lot of door slammer stuff when i was really young and uh then we got into um dragsters probably in the early yeah, it's probably the early 80s, maybe. We ran a, a West Coast series called Top Gas West. And um, it was like a 630 index class. And you could run whatever you wanted. So we used to run big block Chevys on nitrous. And then, um, you know, he, my dad's a retired fireman. And he worked with Big Jim Dunn in the same crew for, you know, decades. So I kind of grew up around the Dunn's also. We always kind of wanted to go nitro racing, but, you know, was, couldn't afford it. And then uh, one day we just kind of said, we were, kind of fell in love with the injected nitro deal when it started to take off and kind of followed the class. And, and uh, back when, like, Hinkleman was driving and, and uh, Baca and, and uh, you know, there's a lot of really cool cars like Junkyard Ed. And we just kind of followed that class and um, uh, kind of fell in love with it. Just it, It's a drug, it, you know, A-fuel racing and nitro methane. And uh, it's, uh, once you run nitro, it's hard to run anything else. So now, which which uh, vehicle did you jump in there? Your dad had a dragster. Yeah, you know when I first started, I started off in a dragster, and it was um, kind of like a top. What we now we pretty much consider it uh, probably like a top dragster. And um, we, I ran an injected Chevy the first time. Like, I mean, I ran a super comp car a couple times just to get a you know a feel for it. And then I moved up to uh, injected alcohol. And then uh, after injected alcohol, went to uh, injected nitro. And we actually ran it, you know, in a shorter wheelbase car. It was a big block Chevy on injected nitro. And we were still running like a 630 index class. And, but kind of, you know, slowly accumulating parts to go into the top alcohol class. And uh, we finally put it all together. And uh, my first race was in Sacramento at the points race. And we licensed, upgraded my license from advanced DT to alcohol on a Thursday and qualified the car for the show on a Friday. So it was pretty fun. That was, uh, that was actually back in 2004. So 2004. So running it ever since. So how was your first time experience in the uh, Top Alcohol Dragster? You know, um, it's kind of a funny story because we had been running an injected Chevy on nitro and the cockpit was the same and the procedure was the same. And I, I can remember when we put the Chrysler in the car and put a clutch in it and everything, we went out to test and, you know, I went over to nitro, you know, and trimmed the levers, did the burnout. And I said, Oh, you know what? That feels about the same. You know, it doesn't feel too different, but, uh, boy, I'll tell you what, when I stepped on the pedal, I was blown away by the, the harmonics, the vibration, the sound. And, uh, of course how fast the thing was accelerating. Um, so it was an eye opener for sure. Um, again, it, it, I want to say it caught me off guard, but I was kind of surprised because I thought, oh yeah, I got this. You know, the burnout, the car felt the same. You know, I trimmed the fuel; it was about the same. And uh, but it, man, it was fun. And that was back when we were on 100 percent nitro. Uh, it was, you know, those were the days when it was really cool to, you know, take your foot off the clutch, put the pumps on the high side, pull that brake as hard as you can, and when you when you put your foot off the clutch, that thing was popping and banging, and you know, wing high header flames. Uh, it, 
it, it was pretty cool. So now after all these years of uh, drag racing, Johnny, what, what still keeps you passionate about it? Stepping on that pedal. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just stepping on that pedal. Um, you know, and, 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 you know, there's so many things about it, you know, I mean, there's, it, it's, it's really rewarding when you can turn the knobs on the car and it responds, you know, the tuning side of it. And then there's the competition side of it, you know, we're actually competing to win and, and that can be pretty addicting and fun. And then there's, um, you know, there's just the fury and of when you step on that pedal and my dad likes to, he likes to get greedy and really turn the knobs up and that thing launches right now. That car is carrying the front end to half track sometimes. Uh, so it's a lot of fun to drive. It's, um, it really plugs in the seat and there's a, there's a harmonic and a vibration to nitro methane, uh, you know, when you're burning nitro in the car that is indescribable. Um, so it's hard, it's hard. It's something that's really hard to give up and I really enjoy doing it. And it's, it's a little bit of a, you know, a lifestyle, a passion lifestyle. I mean, my dad's still heavily involved. You know, he's uh, turn wrenches and tunes the car and, and builds the short blocks. And, um, you know, the, the, it's the in-between races. It's the travel. It's the competition. It's seeing the other racers. And, you know, uh, when you're out there at the track, um, it's, uh, it's, it's an opportunity that I have that um, I'm very blessed that I get to do it. So you said from 2004 till now you've been doing top alcohol? Uh-huh, yeah, and here we are in 2020. Yep, long time. It's, uh, yeah, and, you know, you get a feel for the car to where a lot of it's muscle memory, and I think, um, you know, you don't really think about what's happening in the car, you just kind of react to it, and I think what makes a good A-fuel dri- driver is obviously you got to cut a light, but, um, you know, given the, the crew chief a consistent clutch, you know, as far as the burnout, backing up, stage in the car, and then really what, what makes a good A-fuel driver is catching tire shape tire smoke, things like that, getting the car to recover. Um, you know, a lot of times car goes A to B, but these A fuel cars, they, a lot of times they want to shake the tire too. And uh, there's times where it'll go all the way through qualifying, all the way through eliminations. We can make it all the way to the final round, and all of a sudden the thing wants to shake the tire. You know, it, uh, they're, they can be very, very finicky. And, uh, you know, if you look at it, it doesn't really matter which team it is. You know, they all go through and experience that tire shake. And that's just when the clutch is coming in. Uh, it ain't happy with the with the motor. They're fighting each other. So what are you running? Eighty five percent nitro. We're ninety five. Ninety five percent. Ninety five. So now, how many events we are you looking to run this year? Well, we had ten planned. Um, I'm not sure what's you know it's such a uh, an unknown right now. You know, there's no telling what's going to happen. We were entered for Las Vegas for the national which would have been my first time going four wide. So I was pretty excited about that. And, um, and then we were running the following weekend at the points race, the regional race for us there in Vegas. So those have been postponed right now. The next race on schedule is Houston, but, uh, you know, I mean, uh, who knows if that's even going to happen. So I think, um, like with everything that everybody's got going on, where, whether it's, you know, the NBA or major league or, um, uh, who knows? I mean, everything's kind of on hold. Um, I'd love to even be able to go to the track and do some testing right now just to work on things, sort things out. Uh, but, uh, yeah, there's no telling. So I don't know if our races will get rescheduled or if they'll get canceled. I'm not real sure. So big question mark. So for you, your your dad was your biggest influence for drag racing? Totally. Totally. Yeah, for sure. He um, he still is. He guy's my hero, you know. and He was a, a, a captain for the County Los Angeles Fire Department retired from the fire department and, and always raced cars. So I kind of followed his footsteps, footsteps. I've worked for the fire department also. I'm a captain now and, and, uh, dra- around race cars. And so we're a lot alike. I think, um, you know, it's funny. We'll go right, you know, we drive the truck and trailer together and, uh, you know, he's getting up there in age, but he still likes to, he still wants to drive the long hauls that, you know, I'll fly him in on the longer, you know, the far away races, but, uh, you know, a quick short run to Las Vegas and back from Southern California is not real far. And, you know, he still likes driving the truck and building the short blocks and and uh, tuning the car, you know. And even if we have a bad weekend, you know, maybe we, you know, hurt the motor or, or get beat or shoot ourselves in the foot, so to speak, or something. You know, we're all bummed and putting the car away, loading everything up, and then you get on the road and it's quiet for about a half hour, hour into the drive. And next thing you know, we're talking about, well, all right, what are we going to do for the next race? How we want to, what changes we want to make? You know, we get excited and, and uh, 
you know, definitely keeps you going. I think that's one of the things that keeps him going. You know, he's 76 now, and he's like a 25-year-old kid. Wow. So it's, it's pretty cool. So now, are there any other drag racers that inspired you back in the day? Yeah, probably Big Jim Dunn. You know, he's still out there. He's, I think, 86 years old now and still running his Fuel Funny car. And, um, you know, he was a, a big mentor for me as a kid. And, and he's kind of, when I first started driving the race cars, uh, you know, he kind of taught me how to drive and how to mix nitro and how to trim the fuel levers, you know, when I'm driving and, and how to, you know, keep my foot on the clutch and stage the car. A lot of that was, you know, his influence, you know, when I went to nitro and learned a ton from him. And I, I still go visit him in the shop uh, a lot and uh, stop buying him, I'm, you know, like brothers with uh, uh, his son, John. And, uh, you know, I kind of grew up getting hand-me-down clothes and toys and stuff from uh, Mike Dunn when I was a kid. So it was a big influence and. You know, as a kid, I just thought everybody had a race car in their garage. You know, I didn't know any different. Now, if you were to get asked by a big top fuel team to drive a dragster, would you do that? Heck yeah. <laughs> I do it in a heartbeat. I, I still, even though I'm, uh, I've been doing this a while, and, uh, you know, I've got a family and, and a full-time job and everything else, um, you know, sometimes, you know, when you're younger, you think, okay, that's what I'm going to do. But... As you guys, excuse me, as you get a little uh, older, you know, you start thinking the realization, of, well, maybe it's the closest I'll get, but, you know, you never know. And, um, you know, uh, heck, you know, if, if the opportunity rose, you know, I would not hesitate. I'd climb in one in a heartbeat. I think I'd be pretty good at it, too. <laughs> so, if anybody's listening out there, I'm ready. <laughs> yeah. We just need some races. Yeah. Just need some races to go to. Now, have you ever done any nostalgia drag racing? You know what? I uh, I haven't. Um, I do follow it a lot. A lot of my friends are, you know, with Bakersfield being so close, it's right. kind of like the mecca of, uh, you know, nostalgia racing. And and uh, you know, they, fortunately, they were able to get the march meet, you know, in before all the madness took place. And but uh, yeah, you know, I love. Uh, I, and I'll tell you what, I wanted to drive a front engine top fuel car really bad for a while, and. Uh, we, we, my dad and I actually talked about going that route, and years ago we wound up going the injected nitro, you know, NHRA alcohol dragster side, and um, if, but we were pretty close to going that direction. And um, uh, if I got some friends that that's you know have run them and still do, and you know, nostalgia funny cars are just badass, and uh, you know, a lot of these friends here in Southern California, you know, have them and run them, and and uh, it's pretty cool. Um, yeah, I know, and and I'd probably drive anything if I had the opportunity. You know, who knows? That's another kind of bucket list items I'd love to uh, run a nostalgia funny car. In yeah. fact, my partner. On that note, now that I think about it, we, my uh, one of our racing partners is Howard Catano, and he actually lives on Oahu and flies in to the mainland for all our races. And he ran funny cars back, you know, boy in the seventies, and uh, with his uncle uh, on the island, they came here and they ran on the mainland. And, uh, we, we were, he really wanted to do both. We wanted to run the inject nitro car and then also put a nostalgia funny car together and run just kind of a few West coast nostalgia races. And we got kind of close to doing it, but, uh, you know, it's, it just costs a ton of money You know, you to, to put the cars together is one thing, then to go run them and to maintain them. So we wound up focusing just on the one car and it kind of paid off because, that was probably around 2013 or so, and you know, we started running pretty good and competing then and, and started winning some races. And uh, So I'm glad we kind of focused just on, on one program instead of two to get too distracted. But you never know, you know. Heck, anything can happen. Yeah, it's pretty cool to see guys like Ron Caps doing the field alter at the March meet. <laughs> yeah, you know, when you go to the March meet, it's a who's who of... Uh, of drag racing and it's it's more than a race it's like it's like a cultural happening really and you know for me as a kid growing up you know i used to sleep on a flatbed trailer at bakersfield you know my brother and i would wake up and go play and you know ride our bikes around and um you know it's just a, so to see it still so heavily involved in the the amount of people that come out there and then you know they, they call them big show cars you know but guys like caps and jeff arend and and, I mean, there's so many involved, and the ones that aren't racing are walking around. You know, you're going to run into everybody there. And, uh, you know, I see all the big pros. You know, they, they all come out. And uh, it was pretty incredible to see Ron Caps win that uh, fuel altar. 
win his March meet. That's pretty cool. Um, you know, his dad, you know, earlier when I was talking about that Top Gas West class, his dad used to race against my dad in that class. Wow. There was, there was a lot of racers in it. Doug Herbert's dad ran it and stuff. and So it was uh, it was pretty cool. Yeah, everyone keeps telling me if I need to get up to Bakersfield one, one of these days and check it out on the Nitro, man. Yeah. It's, uh, you know what, it is, uh, it's, you can't describe that event. I mean, the reunion's a big event, too, and they have the hot rub reunion at the end of the year. But the March meet, I mean, you know, you talk to my dad, and, and he went to the first March meet, you know, and he'll tell you all about being a, a teenager and going to the March meet and stuff. And, and here it's still running today. The place is packed. It is, uh, it's the Woodstock of drag racing. And, uh, you know, obviously I go to a lot of the, you know, the big NHRA national events, but it, this is, um, it's just got a different vibe and uh, it's historic and it's packed and, uh, there's a ton of nitro cars, a ton of them. And, uh, it's, uh, it's definitely, I highly recommend going to it just to experience it. It's, um, uh, it's an event, no yeah. doubt. Yep. So now with the top. You know, the dragster, what's, what's been the quickest run you've made with it? Uh, the quickest I've gone is 515, and my quickest mile an hour is, is about 279. Um, and I think we got more in it. We've run, we ran really good throughout the summer last year and into the fall, and uh, we were pretty excited to kind of pick up where we left off. Um, we didn't hurt a ton of parts last year, which was kind of nice. The thing was running good and not tearing itself up too bad i mean it is nitro and eats up parts but uh but yeah the quickest uh, i've been is 5 uh, 15 that was in phoenix and then um i think we're pretty close to running that quick again we kind of fell off you know i wound up changing the, cha the chassis and we got lost a little bit on the setup and then then we really went back last year and really went through our notes and i uh, went through everything on the car you know just literally stem to stern on that car and uh, we really went through our notes did a lot of homework and put the setup in there when we went to Sonoma and right off the trailer I think ran like a 22 I think and uh, it ran strong pretty much the rest of 2019 and uh, we wound up winning up there in Seattle and uh, I think we could have won a few more races um, just got a little greedy and smoked the tire and uh, um, I mean these things are ferocious <laughs> so you gotta be careful sometimes and uh uh, you know, so we ran Pomona was in the Winter Nationals, and the, uh, we qualified okay, but the track was cold, and every, everybody else was shaking the tire too. But we just missed the setup; uh, just did not get it A to B uh, without it shaking. I'd have to pedal it, and you know, the best of the run were, were kind of 40s during eliminations, and uh, so so we ran. You know, we were excited to we serviced the car, got all ready for Vegas, and uh, she's sitting ready to start. She's got to put the push rods in and put some fuel in it. And uh, we can start it up for Vegas or wherever else we go next. Yeah, you got so much, uh, you know, great competition in that field. Yeah, and the West Coast is really tough. We got Joey Severance. We got Chris Dempke. We got Sean Cowie. So we got the three baddest blown cars on the planet. And then you got a really a lot of really, really good A fuel cars. Um, and then they, at the end of the year, you know, everybody comes out West try to get the last bit of points they can, go to the banquet and, and uh, you know, make a lap down the old Pomona quarter mile. And uh, uh, So it's tough. The competition's tough. And uh, we like to think that, you know, we're able to unload and, and put anybody else on their trailer that we can compete to win. Um, and I, I think we can. Yeah, you got the tough girls in there, in there too, like Megan Meyer and Krista Baldwin. Megan, yeah, Megan... The, the entire Meyer uh, operation is probably the most consistent. You know, Randy Meyer is probably the, the best crew chief out there as far as the consistency on an a fuel car, and that's what wins a lot of races. And you know, when the rest of us are getting greedy and smoking the tire, or we shake the tire, or we do things, things like that, he seems to just go A to B. And uh, he's he's the best in the business. There's no doubt. And uh, that number one on that car is well earned. Megan uh, stepped up her. Her driving is really good. She is a very, very tough competitor. You cannot take her light. Um, and those cars, heck, it seems like every time they pull into a racetrack, one of them is going to make it to the final round. Um, so they're tough. And uh, so I like to see them on the west or the east coast, far, far away. And I joke with Megan about that occasionally, like, you know, 
keep your cars on that uh, the other side of the country. <laughs> yeah. Then, you know. then he got uh, Dave, David Harada's team with Will Smith driving. Uh, yeah, Harada. You know, we Harada and I we text each other quite a bit um, and uh, check in on each other and stuff. And he was probably you know when we talk about influences, when I really wanted to go a fuel racing, Harada was like my idol. Like uh, they would come out west, they would run Pomona. And uh, so I'd go over to the trailer and I was hanging on the ropes, you know, watching him work on that thing. And he was running a Fontana motor back then. And um, uh, he was definitely one of my idols, kind of my heroes and stuff. And, and uh, I was kind of like honored and, and in awe that he would even talk to me back then. It was kind of, you know, it's funny, but uh, um, yeah, he's badass. His whole family, you know, the Ferratas and oh, yeah, his that's... parents are, are icons in the sport. And uh, in fact, I'm bugging Dave right now to make, to get his dad to make, he makes my push rod tubes, or uh, I mean my spark plug tubes uh, for the valve covers. And so I've been on uh, on his case to get his dad to make up another set for me. So it's kind of funny. Yeah. But. Uh, yeah, it's a yeah. that is a legendary family right there. Yeah, no, for sure. I wish they, I always bug him to get back in the car. He keeps saying he's too fat. <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean, I'd love to be able to uh, get him in the car and, and you know, stage against him and race him, and it'd be pretty cool. It'd be an honor, you know. Yeah, I was trying to get his dad Kenny to do an interview, but Dave said his dad's kind of hard of hearing, so I, just, I don't know. Yeah, it might be tough to do. Yeah, and I, you know, and he wrote this. He makes these spark plug tubes for us, and, and we need another set. And you know, and I told him the other day, I, you know, I was like, you know, if your dad just doesn't want to do them, I get it. No worries. You know, we'll, we'll buy them from you know Manton or something, and. Yeah, but I like how, but I told him, I go, I like how those in the car because your dad did make them. You know what I mean? And, uh, uh, you know, knowing that his dad made them is, is pretty cool. You know, it's cool. They say Harada Motorsports, you know, like machined into them. They're pretty cool. But, uh, yeah, it's cool. So how many crew members do you have and who are your crew members? Well, my crew members, there's my dad, myself, and then his brother, my uncle, uh, Uncle Bob. And then, um, then there's Howard Catano. He's, uh, who I mentioned earlier, he comes in from Hawaii. And uh, he owns Island Renovations, which is a, uh, one of our sponsors. It's a construction company on Oahu. And then uh, we got Kevin uh, Ovell. We call him Shark. And he's our uh, our main crew guy. And uh, that's kind of the, the meat and potatoes. That's like our nuts and bolts guy. That's, that's the core group. So that's who goes all the races. And then uh, we've got some floaters that come in. We got uh, Todd Rockwell. We got uh, Chuck Castillo uh, that comes in and helps us when they can. But other things will pull them apart sometimes, you know, the races. But when we go up north, sometimes they'll come in and help us. And then, uh, then occasionally, my two young boys. I got a 13 and a 14 year old boy. And in the summertime, they'll um, they'll come to the track, and they usually alternate. So I'll travel, you know, in the summer and come with me and and uh, help her, you know, work on the car. So that's that's kind of that's the crew. We've been together for that same group of guys. We've been together for over 10 years. Um, so, you know, it's like family. Yeah, the whole drag racing sports all one big family. Yeah, it's got to gel. You know, when you got a crew, um, everybody's got to get along and, and gel and and, uh, and enjoy each other's company because you're with each other a lot and um, the travel and everything. So, and, you know, it's tough. A lot of times we don't see, you know, it'll be just my dad and I, for the most part, working on the car in between races. We won't see the other guys, you know, for maybe a month or so. And then when we all meet up at the races, it's, uh, you know, it's like, you know, it's fun to get everybody back together, you know. Now, who are all the sponsors that keep this car out there? Well, you know, we got Advanco Fire Protection. They, uh, they're they a, a company that does really large commercial buildings, you know, your big distribution warehouses. Stuff. They do all the fire sprinklers in those. They're over here in uh, Ontario. Um Got to thank Regal Vasquez for helping us out. We got Entertainment Transport, and what they are is a studio transportation company that helps us out. We've got, uh, you know, I cannot thank Brett Winberg at Clean Boost Oil enough. Uh, him and Jim McClare. The Clean Boost Oil that we run that car, uh, it keeps that thing going. And with Nitro, it, wants to, it just wants to tear everything up. Uh, we uh, bolt everything together. ARP bolts helps us out. Uh, Odyssey batteries, Goodson tool. And of course, NGK spark plugs, um, big big part of our team. Um, Got to thank Layla Martin and, and everybody at NGK. Uh, they are 
they make a plug that uh, can hold up to these nitro motors. And if you'll see now, they're actually in the top fuel cars. They were in Doug Coletta's car for the winter, his Winter Nationals win, and uh, and also in Phoenix for their runner-up. Uh, so you see big things with NGK. They're doing a lot in motorsports now, in drag racing, uh, a lot more, getting more involved. And uh, they help the racers out. They really stay involved, their tech program and everything. You know, I can call up and talk about, you know, um, you know, all kinds of things about the spark plugs, you know, for whatever. And uh, it's, it's pretty awesome. So those, those are our main sponsors that really keep us going. 111 Inc., they're our uh, company that keeps our cars wrapped. They do all the vinyl wraps, the decals, and the design that's on the car right now, they designed for me. Um, and uh, kind of wanted to represent their brand, 111 Inc. And they do a lot of uh, all kinds of stuff from, from food trucks to supercross trailers and bikes to, to obviously a lot of drag racing cars to a lot of studio work. And, uh, and these guys, I'll go in there one day. You never know what you're going to find when I walk in there, you know, to get some decals made up. Well, there'll be, uh, you know, maybe a rapper's uh, Range Rover in there getting a wrap or there's a supercross trailer or there's a boat. They've wrapped helicopters. Um, buildings, you name it. These, uh, Chris and Justin Carmody, uh, they're brothers that, that run the business. They're, uh, they're pretty, pretty amazing. So you guys can always check that out. They got 111inc.com and they're on Instagram and Facebook, of course. So uh, it takes a lot of support from those companies to believe in you, to back you, because these things are, uh, they're really expensive to run. And, you know, it costs a lot of money to maintain them, but just to get them to the track, you know, you look at diesel and you look at, your truck and trailer to get there and you know uh tires and, and everything else you know then to get the crew there to fly people in to get hotels and then uh you know before you even start the car you you spend a ton of money before you even start the car just to get there yeah and then of course uh nitromethane ain't cheap oh no you know <laughs> putting nitro in that thing and uh and uh burning it up and we burn about probably about seven gallons of nitro a pass and uh depending on how much you want to idle in the pits so you can you can go through nitro pretty quick um but the support stuff for the cars i mean just uh it, it's the value to that is huge so you have to really thank uh, you know all of these companies that that help us out and back us and stay with us every year um you know and stick with the team uh it, it really is um you know, very, very uh, appreci- appreciated. Yep. So now, Johnny, um, for people to follow you, you know, where you're going to be at and all that good stuff, what how, what social media sites can they find you on? You know, there's, uh, there's Johnny Otten uh, Racing on Facebook. Uh, I keep that uh, uh, updated. I get a lot of help from uh, uh, uh John Rogers, uh, he's up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and he helps me maintain a lot of stuff. And, and then on Instagram, it's Ott and Racing on Instagram. Um, those are my two main ones there. So you can follow us. We got a lot of uh, in-between race, uh, you know, uh, photos and, and pictures and things to, to keep everybody, you know, posted on what's going on. And then uh, all our race results are always put on there. Motor Racing Press is a great website to go to to find our press releases. Um so I put press releases out before uh, every race to so people know where we're going and what we're doing and and um, motorracingpress.com. You can always check it out there. Uh, so that's kind of like our main things. And then of course, uh, you know, there's you can always Google Johnny Otten Racing or Johnny Otten and, and see a lot of the race results that pop up on NHRA. And there are so many platforms with media nowadays um, that. Uh, it's uh, you know it's not hard to just punch in a name and, and find stuff. It's uh, it's pretty amazing the technology that, that's out there nowadays. Yep. Now, when you're out there on the track, ready to race on the starting line, do you have any uh, pre-race rituals or superstitions when you're in that dragster? Yeah, you know I I, I I always say I'm not superstitious, but I'd be lying. Um, you know, it's kind of funny, like, I'll go into the toter home to get my, put my fire suit on, and uh, there's a couple different, like, benches to sit on, and and I catch myself, like, when I change to put on the fire suit, like, if the car's, if I sit on one side and the car runs good, then I, I sit on that side, you know, until the car doesn't run good, then I wind up sitting on the other side, um, you know, just little things like that, um, that's probably my most superstitious thing, um, I, um, 
the rest of it is kind of a routine. It's kind of muscle memory. You know, I don't mind getting in the car early and sitting in the car. A lot of drivers, they won't get in real, you know, they don't get until the very last second for whatever reason. And it doesn't bother me at all, especially now that the seats are, you know, they're, they're foam that's formed to your body, you know. So it's really comfortable, actually, when I sit in there. And, you know, an example would be like Las Vegas in the fall. You know, I got belted in the car, and then that's when Gordon crashed, Doug Gordon. And so we're in the back of the lanes, and it's late at night, and it was a long day. I was tired. You know, when you get in the car, when you put your helmet on, and you get into the car, and they strap you in there, nobody really comes and talks to you, other than the chaplain will come over, or my dad will come over and tell me something. But everybody kind of leaves you alone. If you're standing in the truck, a lot of people want to talk to you. And when you're kind of getting in the zone, you know, uh, to focus on the car, you know, if you get in the car, nobody really bothers you. Well, I work on the car. You know, I do the in-between rounds. I do the clutch, I do, you know, a lot of stuff on the car. And so I don't get to sit down much. So when I when I get to sit down in that car, that's like when I get to rest a little bit in the lanes. And Gordon, they came over and told me, they said, hey, Gordon just rolled his car, you know. Um, do you want to get out? And I was like, you know what, I'm, I'll just sit, loosen my belts up a little bit. I'll loosen up my shoulder straps, just kind of, I'll just stay here for a second. And Because uh, I hate getting in and out, in and out, in and out sometimes, you know. Right. So I kind of sat there and, Next thing you know is um, Shark, my crew guy, came over and said something to me. And I look at him, and I'm like, oh, how long has it been? And it had been about a half an hour. I fell asleep, and I took <laughs> a 30-minute nap in the car. <laughs> and uh, with my helmet on, you know, seat belted in and everything. Uh, so uh, to me, it's kind of comfortable. It doesn't bother me to get in the car early. Um, but uh, and plus, you know, we we're only in that car for five seconds. We go down the quarter mile, so it's not like you're in the thing for a long time. And, you work so hard on these things and, and you know, it spends so much money to try to, you know, be in this car. I, you know, I like to get in the car. Like, I love it. So. That's a good thing. Yeah. But, uh, that's, yeah, my kind of routine is when I get in the car, it's always kind of the same procedure and everything. The way I'm belted in the car, it's the same procedure. And that's really also just so that we don't miss anything, you know, on the car. Especially when it comes to the safety aspect of it. Right. So now, what kind of preparation goes into getting this dragster ready for a weekend? You know, uh, it all depends. Um, our, we uh, we pull the motors out and go through them quite a bit. Um, and, you know, things you're checking on, on on an A fuel car is a lot of it's cylinder heads. Um, you know, making sure the heads are CC correctly, making sure the valve heights are all correct. Uh, they got to seal up, so you got to have you know good rings so the rack piston racks will come out. We'll go through piston rings. We run uh, combination total seal and Akeley and Childs, and uh, um, you know we uh, the pistons. Everything's got to seal the, the the sleeves. You know we check uh, the bore on those things if they need to be honed or whatnot, and uh, and the heads if the heads need any work. You know we take them out to Brad Anderson's, and and they'll they're they're artists on repairing those things. And probably for me, the most of my work is the clutch program, and that's floaters and discs and flywheels and clutches in between races um it's like a full-time job you know maintaining the clutch program and having enough packs having enough discs having the right combination of discs having the right combination of floaters um in our clutch pack there's four clutch discs and three floaters in between and that's changed every pass so if we're going to go to national event i need at least seven packs uh, ready to go into the car um and so your inventory, you know, you got to maintain a, a certain inventory. And uh, if we want to change what style floater is in there or what style disc or the combination, then we've got to have some extra, you know, of different types to put in there for combinations. Uh, but the motor, you know, in, in between races, it usually comes out and uh, it's tore apart. And when you do that, you're inspecting everything. You're, uh, you know, when you clean things, you're, you know, you're checking for wear and tear for cracks and things. The crankshafts, we'll get those uh, checked, you know, x-rayed for cracks. We'll, uh, you know, um, you know, cause there's just a lot of maintenance. You know, the car itself, when it comes back, it goes in the air in the shop, the body comes off. And pretty much I go through it from the front to the back, checking all, all the welds, the, the tubing, um, you know, going through uh, brackets, bolts. Because things, you know, you won't sometimes you get back in the shop and you're like, holy smokes, look at this, it's about, it's about ready to fall off the car. And um, it just requires a tremendous amount of maintenance as far as that goes. And you want to catch it there in between races. You don't want to find it as you're, you know, getting ready to roll to the lanes. Right. See, there's a crack in something. Um, you know, a lot of times our ignition stuff comes apart and then we send that out to get checked. Um, 
you know, we're just replacing a lot of, you know, you check wiring. Um, the cars, you know, they take a beating out there. And, um, you know, then with the amount of service you do in between rounds, that can take a beating on parts too, you know. So how do you get your mind mentally prepared for a race? My mind mentally prepared, um, it seems like when I'm busy working on the car going rounds and I don't think about the race, I do better. Um, sometimes I think when you can overthink things, I think that uh, part of the driving of these cars and the mental side of it requires, um, I think you got to be calm and the concentration aspect. I think a lot of that spills over from my day job, you know, running into burning buildings and stuff and, and you know, managing fires and making decisions and on, you know, uh, when, you know, car accidents and things as we're making these decisions. A lot of times you're very task oriented during the event. And if you stop and took a deep breath and looked at the whole, the gravity of what was taking place, you wouldn't be able to operate that way. You wouldn't be able to make the decisions. So I think it's kind of the same with the race car. If I don't, you know, if I just get in the car, focus on what my job is, don't think about everything else. I tend to do a lot better. Um, so I try to just kind of relax and focus on my job of, you know, staging the car, making sure that I do the burnout the same way, making sure that, you know, I've let the clutch out the exact amount of times, backing it up, you know, that I've staged it the same, uh, and uh, that I'm focusing on concentrating on, on cutting a good light, um, you know, putting the car in shallow for qualifying, uh, you know, just trying to do the best job that I can do as a driver, um, you know, and uh, I think for me, it's just kind of relaxing and and just, you know, letting my body and my mind just kind of react to the inputs. Because uh, it happens pretty quick in that car, you know. Things are going on quick, and if you really are thinking about what's going to happen, uh, it's already happened by the time you realize what's happened. So you got to react to it a little quicker. And that comes, I think, with seat time, uh, which is one thing I do have a lot of is seat time and and – you know, having the car do a lot of dumb stuff like shaking the tire and smoking the tire a lot of times, you know, carrying the front end, you know, wheel stands and stuff. And, and you, there's no telling what it's going to do. You have no idea. So, but if you think about all these combinations, you're going to be sitting there on the starting line after the green came on thinking about it, you know, and you're going to be dead late. You, you just got to react to it. Now, what, what are some of your favorite tracks to race on? Whew. Pomona's probably one of my favorite, even though um, I have won at, at Pomona in the World Finals, but uh, it seems like, man, I get punched out first round a lot there. Uh, but it's Pomona, you know, the history of Pomona. It's, it's our hometown race, but I love Sonoma. Sonoma's probably one of my favorite tracks to go to. And uh, I really love Seattle. Um, Seattle's one of my favorites. Uh, I'd say my, probably my favorite right now is Sonoma. It's just, it's a beautiful facility. Uh, we, we haul butt there. Um, it's the, the first place I ran a national event in Alcohol Dragster, um, which I coincidentally, the very first event there had a top mile an hour for the event. So I just a lot of good memories. Um, and, uh, and it's fun because when my kids were little, when they were, you know, like toddlers, I'd take the motor home up there and we would we'd stay at the track and camp and stuff. And, and then on Monday, we'd go to, there's an amusement park over in Vallejo. We'd go over there and go to the Six Flags Park. And so it's a lot of good memories. Um, it's just a fun place to go. And, uh, um, you know, there's a lot of tracks I, on my bucket list I'd like to go race at. Um, but uh, as far as, you know, and, I, and I, I miss a lot of the West Coast tracks that we don't run alcohol drag strat anymore. You know, we don't get to run Bakersfield anymore or Sacramento or, uh, a lot of them are gone that we used to race. I used to go to as a kid, but, uh, uh, you know, Pomona, I mean, the history that goes with Pomona, the, you know, the legacy that goes with it, uh, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. We get to run there twice a year. So now what, what would you consider to be the milestones of your drag racing career? Um, well, you know, when I was, when I was younger and I was running like top gas West, top eliminator West as a driver before my alcohol, I dreamed to run an alcohol dragster. And I can remember like, like literally dreaming about being able to run a 530 ET and run an alcohol dragster. And, uh, so to achieve that, um, was a big milestone for me. Um, and I, and I try not to take it for granted what I, that I still have the opportunity to, to do this. Um, 
big milestone was probably the first time I ran in the teens um, in uh, in Phoenix, and uh, you know, of course, winning a national event um, is uh, something that not a lot of guys, you know, they raced their whole lives and never won a national event, and to win one. And it was my first final round against, uh, you know, the world champ, Jim Whiteley. Uh, it wasn't easy to get there. I had to go through, uh, boy, I remember that day was Sean Cowie, Joey Severance, uh, Mark Tolliver, and then uh, Jim Whiteley in the final. You know, all the baddest, toughest blown cars in the country, basically. I didn't get to pair against any A-fuel cars in eliminations, and, uh, and we got to bring home a Wally. And home track, you know, my wife and kids were there. A lot of guys, a lot of farmers I work with were, were there attending the race. And uh, so to do it at home, to win your first race. Um, John Rogers was there from Michigan, you know, my, my uh, press guy at media. And it was uh, it was just a, a wonderful day. You couldn't have written a, better, written a better script. That was a huge milestone. And then it was cool because we got to go over. We won on the IHRA side of, of one there. Uh, so, you know, and then I, I'd say – just getting able to do it with my dad. It's a milestone every time, you know, it's, I'm, uh, I'm really lucky. So would you consider that Wally, one of your, uh, would you consider that your fondest memory? Probably so. I'd say that, that the national event Wally, we've got some other ones from division races and, um, my dad's got a bunch on the shelf that are his, but, uh, mine, that, that one there is no doubt, uh, the proudest moment, uh, that I've got, you know, in racing and, if I never accomplish another, another thing, I know that that one, you know, uh, was a huge monkey off of my back. And, uh, you know, of course, I, you know, when you win, you want to win more. It gets addicting. Um, but uh, that one, you know, I'm, I'm super, super proud. Do you have a most embarrassing moment on the track? Hmm, most embarrassing moment. Good question. Um, boy, I've done some dumb stuff. You know, uh, I'll tell you, it's embarrassing when you red light. And uh, um, I haven't done it a lot of times, but to me, in an A-fuel car, when you red light, it's pretty bad. And uh, um, a couple times that I've done it, the car is creeping. And, I, and I, the last time I did it, I remember specifically, was Woodburn. And it was my fault because I didn't pull the brake hard enough and the car was creeping. And uh, it was against Garrett Bateman. And... Uh, I, you know, I think I had him covered and would have, and would have beat him if I hadn't read, you know, read lit. And, uh, but I did, and it was all my fault. And so, you know, when you're, when you, it's a long tow home when you make an error like that, you know. So that's, that's probably my most embarrassing. I haven't, uh, you know, there's been times where we were testing, you know, the cars years ago, and, and, uh, you know, I can remember I didn't put fuel, enough fuel in the car, and it would like shut off after the burnout and stuff. And, and, uh, you know, and, and actually, now that we talk about it, I do know my most embarrassing moment was at Pomona, uh, World Finals. I qualified number two behind Bill Reichert, and uh, with a career best at the time, it was like a 527 or something, and Reichert was number one, and we go up there, obviously I've got lane choice, and we are looking good to, to win that weekend, and when they started the car, we had a fuel line that was... Uh, disconnected and they could not get the fuel line on and we dumped nitro all over where we were you know starting the car behind the burnout box wow and they had a big they had painted the ground with like a big nhra uh logo for the event the sponsored event whatever it was i can't remember and the nitro smeared all the paint and when we rolled out of there it like was on our tires <laughs> and we like ruined the it was on you know it's first round so it's on a saturday afternoon <laughs> ruined the starting line for the TV cameras and everything. Wow. Yeah, so that right there, that was my most embarrassing moment. Pack stands and everything. <laughs> wow, thank Gave you. that one away. Yeah. Well, Johnny, I want to thank you very much for uh, taking time to do this interview tonight. Dave, I appreciate you inviting me out here. And to, uh, to all the fans out there listening, thank you guys for following us. Uh, and uh, just everybody's got to hang in there, do our part, you know, to get through this COVID-19 uh, deal and and uh, you know we're doing our part here on our end and, and uh, they'll be racing soon enough and uh, you know, in the meantime we'll just have to just hang tight you know that's all we can do yeah I know you got the itch to get out there and start racing yeah definitely 
boy, do I ever. <laughs> yeah, it's my therapy. <laughs> well, when you ever do, when you ever do start racing again this year, I wish you the best of luck with the season, Johnny. Thanks, Dave. Keep in touch, and uh, uh, thanks for uh, inviting me on the show. No problem. You have a great night. All right, man. Okay.